there is a legend attached to the baths about a prince called Bladud, who isn't very famous, but his son, King Lear, I think is very famous. People know the Shakespeare play. Bladud suffered from leprosy and was thrown out of his court and became a swineherd. He discovered the baths, which were then just huge bubbling pools of mud, of course, by accident, and his pigs seemed to be cured by the water. So legend has it he bathed himself, returned to his court healed, and that's when the real events started to happen around this wonderful pool of hot springs. Welcome to Bath, one of the most popular stops for American visitors to England. Of course, the very name of the town tells you the importance of the baths in the early history of the town. Our expert on this early period is Kame Chapman Cameron, and I asked her what the baths meant to the Romans who built them. Well, the baths were a social meeting point. People would come here maybe two or three times a day in Roman times, and they would discuss business with their partners. They would bathe. They would go into the gymnasia and the various saunas and other facilities that were on the site. Um, ladies could come here for their hairdressing, and perhaps one of the most cringe-making facilities that was on the site was the resident armpit hair plucker, who would look after you in one of the alcoves that you see here around the Great Bath. So it was used for many purposes, plus the religious site, and it was terribly important. It was a major temple to a goddess here. A temple built to the goddess Sulis Minerva. Much of that temple and a huge amount of the original baths are still there. And, of course, the hot spring that has pumped water into the area for thousands of years at a constant temperature of 46 and a half degrees centigrade continues to do so. If you like your history ancient, you must visit the baths. From talking to the many American visitors that I do, um, they're really hit by this huge sense of history that that Bath abounds in. Um, It's probably the only city in Britain where you can see how people lived 2,000 years ago and step out and then see how they lived just 100 years ago and we follow all the way through. And to me, I, I think when I've spoken to American visitors, that's, that's what's really amazed them. Um, and the fact that it's so beautifully preserved. And perhaps the most beautiful and elegant feature of Bath is its unparalleled rows of Georgian terraces built in the latter half of the 18th century. The best place to absorb the atmosphere of these superb buildings is in Royal Crescent. The house at number one is open to visitors and has been restored and furnished exactly as it must have been when it was first occupied in 1778. Elizabeth Grant, curator. I think the feeling is as you come up the stairs and enter into the house of stepping back 200 years really, going back into the 18th century and the overriding impression of the house is of a living place, not a museum. Often the 18th century occupiers of these majestic houses were not permanent residents. They came to Bath for the season, to use the supposed healing benefits of the hot springs and to drink the spa water. Among them were the family of the novelist Jane Austen. Our tour guide, Jane Glazer, told us about some of the places visitors like the Austens would have been. They came early in the morning in their sedan chairs, carried here. They changed into bathing clothes. The women wore high-necked and long-sleeved robes, little caps on their heads, and uh, carried into the water a basin with their necessities. The men uh, wore breeches and a waistcoat, also made of heavy material. They used very heavy material for these bathing clothes so that they wouldn't cling but would rather billow out, filling up with the water. Everything depended on decency. Another must on your tour of Bath is one of the last great medieval churches to be built, Bath Abbey, begun in 1499. But as the rector, Canon Richard Askew, told us, Christianity in Bath goes back long before that. Christianity goes back a long way in Bath. In Roman times, when the bath establishment here was thriving, if you wanted to get your own back on somebody, you wrote a terrible curse on a bit of uh, lead, rolled it up and threw it in the baths. Uh, One of these uh, curses asks the goddess Minerva to fix whoever had stolen the writer's purse. And he says, whether slave or free, whether pagan or Christian. Now, we know, therefore, there were Christians around in Bath 
about the year 350 AD. And Cannon Askew also has some observations on how beneficial the baths actually were to people who sought cures here. On the walls, we've got a staggering number of memorials, which are in themselves a social history. There are over 600. I think no other church in Britain except Westminster Abbey has more memorials. This is because people came from far and wide, all over Britain and from far beyond, to take the waters of Bath, which were supposed to cure you. Bath Abbey is, in fact, an enormous memorial of the total uselessness of Bath waters in curing anybody of anything. And uh, to put it uh, bluntly, before re refrigeration, you were buried where you died. And that's why uh, you are standing at the moment on 4,000 coffins. Uh. <laughs> so, do enjoy your trip to Bath, but don't be tempted to plunge into the water in search of a magical cure.